I will go ahead and introduce this wonderful uh, pre-conference celebration by the World Health Organization, together again from evidence to reality. And it gives me great joy to introduce our main moderator for this session, Frida Berg, RN, RM, MSc. Frida is a technical officer in nursing and midwifery at the Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health and Aging at the World Health Organization, Geneva. Frida is by background a Swedish registered nurse, a registered midwife, and is a Master of Philosophy in Sexual, Reproductive and Perinatal Health and Educated Maternal and Newborn Healthcare System Designer. The past two years working at the World Health Organization country office Sierra Leone and has worked closely with the Ministry of Health and Sanitation and aims to support quality of care best practice in midwifery education, nursing and midwifery leadership and practice. So let's welcome Frida to the stage. Thank you, Frida. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. We at WHO are honoured to present in this pre-conference. So we want to start our presentation with a welcome to this celebration of midwives by a pre-record video from our beloved WHO Chief Nerd Officer, Dr. Amelia Lato, up to you, Mango uh, Tutipaloto. Please, over to you. I am delighted to be together with you again, celebrating the International Day of the Midwife. You accompany us across our life cycle and our choices, through which we are brought into humanity. I applaud the extraordinary work you are doing, providing compassionate, safe and quality care. And you are referred to, with our nurses, the heroes of our time. Evidence suggests that investment in midwifery care would yield important returns, including, first, more positive birth experiences. This is already impacting realities for women and newborn around the world. Second, improve health outcomes. And third, inclusive and equitable economic growth. We therefore all have a duty as we celebrate today to continue to raise the profile and translate this grand evidence to solutions. It is time to act now to promote, support, respect and value midwifery in order to attract and retain midwives for the long term to ensure continuous professional development is a reality, to transform midwifery education to international standards, to support equitable distribution of midwives in cities, in rural areas and outer islands. I conclude, together, let's celebrate on all grounds and at all levels to ensure that sound evidence transform midwifery care, health systems, supporting universal health coverage, sustainable development goals, ensuring inclusive and equitable development and improved health outcomes for women, newborn and for all. Thank you so much, Amelia, for taking the effort to actually uh, give us this wonderful speech today. And I know that you are part uh, in this. So if you want to, you can actually turn up your camera and we can see you live if you want to. Thank you so much, Amelia, for this 
welcome speech and for the effort you do uh, to actually welcome us at this International Day of Midwifery. Thank you so much, Amelia. So let us go to the next step in our agenda. We want to do an opening remark and we're going to listen to a pre-record uh, message from our Director General at WHO, our beloved Dr. Tedros. Dear colleagues and friends, my greetings to everyone joining today and especially to all midwives. We have come together to recognize the extraordinary work you do all over the world. Research shows the vital role midwives play in providing reproductive health and family planning services and in protecting and promoting maternal and newborn health. Yet, we still need hundreds of thousands more midwives to meet the health needs of our communities. We must improve the quality of education for midwives, increase the number of midwives in senior leadership positions, and make sure they are supported and protected in their workplaces. WHO collaborates with our sister agencies, UNFPA and UNICEF, and the International Confederation of Midwives to advance these policy areas in the WHO Global Strategic Directions for Nursing and Midwifery. I would also like to encourage you all to engage with the Nursing and Midwifery Global Community of Practice, which forges connections, builds the skills of nurses and midwives, and amplifies their voices in global dialogue. Thank you to each and every midwife for all your efforts to safely bring new life into this world. I wish you a very happy International Day of the Midwife. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros, for that wonderful speech. So now it's time to go over to the presentations that we have prepared for you all. The first presentation, it's uh, called Evidence to Reality in Six Country Strategy Findings. And the presenters for this presentation will be Clara Fisher and Dr. Lorena Binfa. Okay, thank you, Frida. Um, I'm um, very happy to be here today and hopefully this will be amazing. This is a very important conference, so we think that midwifery is a vital solution for many women, children, and that's why it's necessary to invest in high quality education and training, invest in midwifery leadership and governance, invest in health workforce planning management and regulation and in the work environment and of course invest in mid wife led improvements to sexual reproductive maternal neonatal uh, adolescence health service delivery so uh this is a project which is a joint collaboration from who unfpa unicef and ICM uh, taking uh, as a base the framework for action for strengthening quality midwifery education for universal health coverage 2030. And this project, which we are going to talk in this moment, was implemented in six countries and included both public and private sectors. The countries include Sierra Leone, Malawi, Liberia, Bolivia, Pakistan, and India. And WHO is being supported by the Merck for Mothers Foundation to implement this project, which is part of a wider program, strengthening quality care for mothers and newborns to achieve universal health coverage. The framework is based 
on a seven-step action plan, which will be fully described later. And the project also takes into account the WHO Global Strategic Directions for Nursing and Midwifery 2021-2025, which presents evidence-based practices and an interrelated set of policy priorities that, if adopted, can help countries ensure that midwives and nurses optimally contribute to achieving universal health coverage, another population health goal. The strategic direction for nursing and midwifery comprises four policy focus areas, education, jobs, leadership, and service delivery. Each focus area has a strategic direction articulating a goal for the five-year period. Enactment of the policy priorities can support advancement along the four strategic directions. This project is focused in two areas, education, through educating enough midwives and nurses with competences to meet population health needs, and leadership, by strengthening nursing and midwifery leadership throughout health and academic systems. We found uh, through a lot of work and especially focusing gather data that um, it's a need for coordination and alignment. Clear and urgent needs for coordination and alignment of implementing partners and donors behind one government plan for midwifery to maximize investments. Uh, this was done in the six participating countries and how to address midwifery leadership by implementing a national midwifery tax force. It is possible and empowering to assess national midwifery leadership capacity and identify action needed. The other important thing is gather data because government requests for a mechanism to collect, analyze and manage and have ownership of midwifery data, a country level kind of dashboard. Also engage the private sector, which is complex and highly politically sensitive and need to know more for better integration of public and private sector collaboration. And last, uh, issues related to climate change, uh, because uh, the midwives must be aware that uh, change in, 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 in in temperature in, in, in warm uh, areas it may be um, complex for 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 healthy environments and also for their own um, health so that is very important to achieve and there is just less very a lack of information and um, this is strongly uh, needed and strong demand to be aware about this climate change for help people and for their own health in among midwives. The six participating countries, as I mentioned, first starting in India, Pakistan, Malawi, later Sierra Leone and Bolivia were included, and the last one is Liberia. Um, it's up to you now, Clara. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you so much. Yes, hello. My name is Clara. I'm a Swedish JPO and technical officer at the Family and Reproductive Health Division at the WHO Country Office Liberia, where I'm also joining you from today. Um, and as Lorena has introduced you to the framework for action on strengthening the free education and leadership, uh, let me dive into our methodology, the seven step action plan. Rather than focusing primarily on national midwifery curricula when improving midwifery education, the seven step action plan acts as a guide to help build sustainable midwifery education and training uh, and doing so by systematically building partnerships around midwifery leadership and adding public engagement and advocacy. 
The six countries in the framework's global community are all in different stages of the circle at the moment, but after reviewing outcomes, there will always be a reason to act on new challenges. So it is supposed to be a never ending circle. One of the first tasks for all countries when launching the framework for action was to create a country midwifery leadership profile. And I will not have time uh, to walk you through our methodology in detail, but the aim of the leadership profiles was to map midwifery education and leadership in each country by interviewing stakeholders, partners, and midwifery practitioners. The outcome you see here on the slide summarizes the findings that were similar in all countries. Uh, a successful transition to midwifery-led care can only be achieved by individuals who are willing to become leaders and visionaries in their discipline. The leadership dilemma we found on different levels, but in all countries, was that there seems to be a missing collective midwifery identity and a low status of women in society holding back individuals to serve as leaders. Although I know but these results cannot stand alone. Uh, one needs to have an in-depth understanding of midwifery practice in each country, and that is reflected in our leadership profiles. Let me briefly present uh, the framework's collective achievements. Although each country would uh, have many national achievements to add, uh, the list of achievements would be very long. Um, but we have established, as Lorena mentioned, the National Midwifery Leadership Task Forces in all six countries in order to create a forum for midwifery stakeholders and individuals to exchange knowledge and overcome challenges in leadership. We developed tools and methodologies such as the first Global Midwifery Leadership Profile tool. Our country midwifery leadership profiles identified the levels of involvement of midwives in each country, their policy development, as well as helping and hindering forces in the participation of midwives. On the right side uh, on this slide, you see a picture of our global midwifery conference in Sierra Leone in 2022, which was also, as we understood, uh, the first global conference in person after the COVID pandemic. One of the framework for actions uh, strength is the global impact uh, that it has. Uh, by collecting knowledge and connecting midwives on an international level, we were able to improve the alignment of international midwifery stakeholders and the coordination of midwifery. We support the alliance of improving midwifery education with the purpose to jointly implement the framework for action, and we see the implementation of the framework for action as a milestone in strengthening the health workforce of midwives globally and in ending the preventable maternal mortality. Before I end, I would also like to address uh, one of the questions that was uh, already asked to our team, to Lorena and me, uh, about the emerging issues on climate change, and if we could explain how we expect that climate change could influence midwifery. And we discussed this in our midwifery, uh, in our framework for action meetings as uh, droughts, rising temperatures and natural disasters are a threat to maternal and newborn health in general. And we believe that it will therefore impact the work of midwives as well. So uh, we have added this to the agenda as well. And now I leave over to you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Clara and Lorena for this brilliant presentation and for the audience I just want to say if you have any questions we will have a Q&A in the end of the session so you can save your questions then or just type them in the chat and we will raise them at the end of the Q&A session. So now it's time for the next presentation, Transition of Midwifery Models of Care. And the one who will present this one is Justine Lee Lewis. And so she will bring you, walk you through this work uh, that WHO are doing in the stage. So please, over to you, Justine. Thank you so much, Frida. Dear colleagues, estimados colegas, estimadas colegas, chers colleagues, d'origine, salam alaikum, ni hao. My name is Justine Lelez. I'm a midwife and WHO consultant. Um, currently working on transitioning to midwifery models of care with the stage working group. And uh, I will guide you through what is stage and what do we mean by transitioning to midwifery models of 
healthcare. But first, let's um, look at what is the problem. And as I'm sure you already know, um, there is a, still a high maternal and newborn mortality and morbidity around the world. And every day, 800 women are dying from um, during pregnancy, childbirth, or postpartum period. 5,400 stillbirth and 6,500 neonatal deaths a day. Um, and for those who survive, 27 million morbidity episodes each year uh, due to the five most frequent complications. Um, in addition to this, we know that poor quality um, of care exists and is contributing to more than half of those maternal and newborn deaths worldwide. Um, the care is often uh, described as discontinuous um, and provided by multiple providers with an inadequate link to the community and the wider health system. Moreover, we know that there is a global shortage of nearly one million midwives around the world when women want to have increased competent and better supported health workers, including midwives and nurses, to provide respectful, dignified and non-discriminatory care. So one of the solutions is for countries to transition to midwifery models of care and what we mean by this is um, the process for each country are moving over time for no midwives at all, um, providing midwifery services to well-functioning systems in which midwives are educated to international standards regulated and work within an enabling policy and health system environment. And why scaling up midwifery? Well, we know from the, the evidence that more than 80% of skilled care during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period can be provided by midwives when they are educated to international standards regulated uh, within a health system and an enabling environment. Um, we also know that um, by achieving universal coverage of midwife delivered interventions by 2035, um, we could decrease 67% of maternal deaths worldwide and 64% of newborn deaths, saving the lives of more than 4.3 million um, mothers and newborns around the world. But even with a 10% increased coverage um, every five years up to 2035, we could avert 22% of maternal deaths, 23% of neonatal deaths, and 14% 14, 14, of stillbirths, saving 1.3 million lives around the world. An example of a midwifery model of care um, is the midwife-led continuity of care model. And here on that slide, we see the results from a Cochrane systematic review, which is one of the highest evidence we can have in research um, about the impact of having this midwife-led continuity model of care. Okay, the midwife community of care around the world. Uh, so as you see in the, this map, we have a lot of different kind of midwifery models of care. They, uh, so this is actually a group that we uh, developed in WHO, the Stage and Technical Advanced Group for, of Experts. Uh, we call it Stage. And this Stage group is focused on maternal, newborn, child, adolescent health and nutrition. It was developed in 2022 and it's independent group. And it was uh, advised by our Director General. For now, we have 31 members from all WHO regions and shared by C. Homer, midwife. The stage group uh, should uh, provide strategic technical advice for WHO on MNCAHN and to inform the WHO agency primary healthcare and universal co coverage with focus on maximum countries' impact in collaboration global leadership in the field. During the first stage meeting, the actually the outcome was three recommendations, and the recommendations involved the trans transition of midwifery models of care. So the first recommendation was that WHO should support countries in the transition of the uh, collaborative midwifery models of care. Uh, we will only support the countries who actually want to do the transmission. It's not forced onto. Uh, we will give them poli uh, policy advice and implement guidance. Uh, this, okay, and all these uh, models of care will be 
adapted to the country's context, to the country's health system, uh, and be a solution for the workforce. So the second recommendation, in line with the member states' endowment of the state director of nursing and midwifery world health, is in 2022, WHO is convened the stage working group bringing together key stakeholders, <laughs> ensure midwifery responsibility and develop in, uh, implementation guides to support countries' transition for midwifery models of care, including collaboration with technical work, uh, and network and care leadership and engagement for private and no profit section. Over to you, Christine. Sorry about this. So thank you so much, uh, Frida, for covering. So I guess you um, mentioned the second recommendation was a very important recommendation that in line with the member state endorsement of what Lorena uh, presented, the strategic direction for nursing and midwifery at the World Health Assembly 2021, um, the World Health Organization to convene a stage working group, bringing together key stakeholders and ensuring midwifery representation to develop implementation guidance to including collaborative teamwork, networks of care, uh, leadership, and engagement of private and non-profit making uh, third sector. The working group should develop the implementation guidance within a 12-month time frame, as well as an agenda for evaluation of implementation of midwifery models of care in different country health systems. And the third recommendation is about what Dr. Tedros mentioned in his speech, the WHO uh, Global Nursing and Midwifery Community of Practice, that stage endorsed um, as um, to establish a continued learning agenda on transitioning to midwifery models of care, which links to ending preventable maternal mortality and every newborn action plan, and other global programs for improving continuity of maternal and newborn care and improving outcomes and prevention of stillbirth. So I won't spend too much time on the theory of change, but just to tell you that WHO is currently uh, finalizing um, a theory of change for midwifery and soon to be published. And this theory of change um, identified five elements of change that were endorsed by um, a majority of uh, partners in two large uh, virtual meetings with the 90% agreement of the domain. Um, showing you this to let you know how did we um, establish the structure of the working group. So this working group, the stage midwifery working group, has three subgroups from the domains of change identified in the theory of change. The first one is the subgroup the midwife. The second one is the subgroup health systems. And the third one is enabling policy regulation and environment. There is a cross-cutting uh, cutting issue which is women, newborns, families, and communities that will be addressed in all of the subgroups and is crucial um, um, in this working group in general. And a monitoring and evaluation framework will be also um, established by the working group. Um, all of the above is supported by what we call WHO Secretariat. So who are the members of the working group? The co-chairs are Jane Sandral, a stage member, and Sally Pearman, the um, chief executive officer of the International Confederation of Midwives. Also, each of the subgroups have, has two colleagues, um, and those two colleagues are members of the working group to ensure coordination. Um, there is also three stage members, among which um, Caroline Homer, the stage chair and the midwife, um, several professional organizations, because this work is going to be collaborative and it's very important. So FIGO, the Federation, International Federation of uh, Gynecologists and Obstetricians, the International Pediatric Association, the International Confederation of Nurses, and also the uh, Organization of Neonatal Nurses, COIN. UN Partners, so uh, UNHPA, United Nations Population Fund, and the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. But also, as I was telling you, central to this is to have the women and newborns and families and communities voices represented by um, WRA, the White Ribbon Alliance, and by CN. For the subgroups, so far we have established the subgroups um, and it was key to ensure geographical distribution from all the regions and subregions of the world. So you can see here um, on the graph that um, 
this has been respected. Uh, and the members are from uh, different backgrounds, academia and research, professional association, regulation bodies, government representatives. Um, our colleagues were mentioning the importance of literacy leadership. So um, we have some high leadership positions from governments in literacy, health system specialists, program managers, but also women, newborn family and communities representatives. And in total, out of those 45 plus members of the subgroup, we have more than 60% of midwives. So very briefly to finish, the next steps will be to present these updates to stage um, on the 16th of May 2023, finalize the standard of framework for developing guidance, um, and finally start the subgroup discussions that are going to be um, very rich, draft the implementation guidance, and as you saw in the second recommendation, present the draft guidance before the end of 2023. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I know that you have worked hard on this and I know it's a lot to do. So if you have any questions for Justine on this project and if anything was unclear, and so just type in the uh, chat or ask your questions in the Q&A in the end of the session. So now we're looking forward to hear about the midwifery toolkit. Uh, the presenter for this toolkit will be Dr. Andrew Kaur and uh, Florence West. Uh, so over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Frida. I'm really happy to be here today um, uh, with Indy to present uh, a short presentation about the WHO Interprofessional Toolkit um, that has been uh, pilot tested in India as part of the midwifery uh, initiative in India. I'm a midwife. I'm currently in Australia, but I live in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, I'll let uh, Indy introduce herself. So the Interprofessional Midwifery uh, Education Toolkit has uh, various resources. Uh, these include the facilitator and learner guides, it's a blended learning approach with some pre-course learning done online. And then um, facilities and education institutes can facilitate um, the courses over one to five days, depending on uh, what course they choose to implement, mainly as a continuing professional development uh, in in-service uh, training focuses on the midwifery model of care, of course, uh, evidence-based practice. And um, on the orange line there, you can see the various courses that will be on offer. Uh, Cross-cutting themes, of course, always respectful care, mental health and leadership. Uh, it's grounded, as our previous colleagues have, have said, uh, in the uh, quality maternal um, newborn care framework, uh, and I think all of us are familiar with this table. And uh, we'll, I'll just talk briefly about the Essential Childbirth uh, Care course, which is one of the toolkit courses. So the tool, this um, Essential Childbirth Care course, which we call the ECBC, is derived from evidence uh, in these documents, as you can see on your slide. Um, the WHO recommendations for intrapartum care positive childbirth experience, the labour care guide, uh, and the other um, evidence-based guidelines you can see there. So the childbirth care course, ECBC, contains five modules. The introduction module is currently on the WHO website, and the first stage of labour, second stage, immediate newborn care, and third stage, and referral modules will be up very shortly. I'd like to pass now to Indy, uh, who can give some evidence to reality perspective uh, about implementing the ECBC and pilot testing it in India. Indy. Good morning, everybody. My name is Indy. Um, I'm a midwife uh, from the UK and I'm currently based in India, helping support and, and embed professional midwifery. Uh, just thank you so much, Florence, for, for bringing 
the the key in uh, to such an important subject. Um, you know, India has made enormous strides to embed midwifery and respectful maternity care in the country. Um, I'd just like to share our, our experience of uh, testing this mo uh, mo model. So um, our National Midwifery Training Institute in Fernandes has impacted 10 sites across in India. Um, we had the privilege to, to pilot the ECBC uh, course with our midwifery uh, educator trainees and um, uh, it was a pretty exciting time because uh, we must not take for granted that India is still at the infancy and whilst trying to embed professional midwifery a lot of the educators are also learning uh, midwifery so this tool uh, toolkit proved really beneficial um, and we had uh, the previous Elizabeth Iro, who endorsed this program, and our trainees were really excited to meet her and, and had a certificate. What we did was um, we piloted it over three days uh, in 2020, and it was really innovative because despite the constraints, our midwives enjoyed, uh, our learners enjoyed the different methodologies, um, and, and a certificate was also given to them from the World Health Organizations, which helped because they loved the certificates as well. Um, but the three days was was packed with, with fun, but very importantly, um, understanding what midwifery is and using uh, standardized WHO quality of care framework. Uh, and it really helped them because as I said, you know, we've, we've had the uh, privilege of being midwives for a while, for a long time, and then training, where else our learners had to learn both very quickly. Uh, so, so understanding what are respectful care calls, and more importantly, evidence-based um, care, and and having the WHO structures was very helpful. Um, the the other thing as well which is really important to say was we felt that the the course would be beneficial not just for the in 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 for the uh, learners that were starting midwifery training um, to to train the new uh, nurse practitioner midwives but it was a, a good tool to use as a continuous professional development so they can use the methodologies because most of the um, lessons in India has been very didactic. So the new innovative uh, uh, and quality of care approaches actually helped them. It also helped our international midwifery educators who came to India to support the NP, the, the nurse practitioner midwifery educators, which helped standardize um, in the states that where we were impacting on training. We also felt that this tool toolkit was um, would be very useful uh, for healthcare professionals, such as like our medical students, because a lot of challenges also come to within the obstetric fraternity. But the evidence could also help them uh, and to contribute in in the training. And uh, um, most most importantly, the styles that was used was was innovative and. Um, what what was was used as well um, in in this picture it shows uh, healthcare professionals working as a team uh, looking after a woman when she comes in into labor and uh, learn how learners apply uh, teamwork to achieve quality care for women and the newborn so that was very powerful how each and every one of us play an important part and sometimes um, biasness happen and uh, and being respectful to each other's profession. Um, uh, we we had learnings from from two states. So facilitators and learners in Gujarat and the Telangana states in India, and these educators were becoming uh, ECBC facil facilitators because once they piloted it, the few in in the subsequent training that we had we actually used that within our curriculum before they went back to the states and uh, these are the educators which you will hear a video on how they found it impacted um, on on their learning as well um, and the next slide is um, uh, we must be mi uh, mindful that a lot of the learners were were taught in the didactic way and hence, the math, some of the methodologies that was used, for example, like role play, 
simulation, you know, treasure hunts where evidence was seeked and sought and how you can introduce birth companions because we take for granted that a woman um, always has a birth companion. This is one huge challenge that we face in when we are uh, training in India. So the learners could actually use these concepts and change can't happen straight away. So the point of quality care uh, tool also help because what do you do next if you can't make a change? Because a lot of changes needs to be done at the higher level. So, so that was very useful. And of course, the video showing infection control and safe care for women and newborn. Um, so the group activities, um, we have a video from, from some of our learners to share how they felt it was. Greetings from Hyderabad. I am Ruth Joshila Phillips. I am a MSc nurse, presently training to be midwifery educator. I am working as a faculty in the Government College of Nursing, Hyderabad. I enjoyed being part of the ECBC Telangana pilot project. What I like most about the project is that it has introduced me to wealth of knowledge and evidence that is available in midwifery which has woman-centered approach. The program, it has enabled critical thinking in me through the exercises, especially the Pocky cycle. It helped me to analyze things in a systematic way in the light of WHO recommendations. COVID times have pushed us as a team to try things virtually and we as a team has proved the strength of teamwork. And yes, I think the module can also be used virtually. I like to see the module to be more clear about the philosophy of interpersonal midwifery care because where I work right now, the concept of midwifery-led care is just evolving and needs clarity. I look forward for the final publication of this module and also wish for antenatal and postnatal modules. I am sure these modules are going to be great tools for every midwifery care provider, not only in India but also all over the world. Hi, I am Sheetal Samson. I am a clinical midwife and educator holding a master's degree in OBGYN nursing. I work at Fernandez Hospital, Hyderabad, India. What I liked about pilot testing the ECBC course was the access to wealth of evidence-based information. The point of care quality improvement exercise ignited a whole lot of critical thinking. This is tremendously empowering. I would like to see improvements in few areas though. I feel integrating learning activities related to essential skills of newborn resuscitation, controlled cord traction, and handover or referral communication would enhance effective use of the related action plan, checklists, and records. I look forward to every midwifery care provider and midwifery educator in India having access to this course. Together, we shall achieve more. Thank you for sharing that. So what, what are the next steps? Uh, it's, it's very exciting that it's now out there uh, with the changes made from the group. And uh, we're working with partners and adapting it, uh, not just in India, but other countries, Pakistan, Malawi, Sierra Leone, Bolivia, and other countries to follow. And the resources are all available now on the WHO website. And if you need any further information, Frida is your person to contact and her t address is there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Flores and Linda. This is brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're looking forward to see the next step in this project. And I really looking forward to see what you think about the presentations. So if you have any questions or want to see anything, uh, say anything, just end a comment in the chat or ask questions in the Q&A. So now we come to the next and the final presentations. And I actually want uh, Emily to put on your camera because this is my co-worker uh, to preparing this event. So Emily and I have worked almost day and night. Uh, so Emily, now is your turn to shine. Uh, so over to you. Well, thank you very much, Frida. And good afternoon and good evening 
everybody on this wonderful meeting. It's a real honor to be joining you. And I have to say, it's been a pleasure to work on this with Frida. We've, we've had a lot of fun um, bringing you this and actually listening to it all ahead of, uh, ahead of the presentations. You don't get a sense of the amount of work, but, but, but hearing them just now, it was really, it's really inspiring to see. And on a day of today, I, I'm a nurse and a midwife, and I get to celebrate both international days. Um, but I feel really proud of midwives this year. It's been a hard year and I'm very, very pleased to be one of you. So, um, I, as I say, my name is Emily McQuerta. I work in the um, Chief Nursing Office in HQ in Geneva. And I have um, two things to talk to you about that are really connected, um, but really want to talk about what we've been doing uh, in the Chief Nursing Office over the last few months. So some of you will have heard in Dr. Tedros's opening address, he mentioned our global community of practice. Um, and I wanted to just bring your attention to that here. There's a QR code on our screen just appeared now. So if you're not a member of this fantastic global community, please just um, put your phones on, take a picture of the QR code and it will take you straight to the site where you can join our community. We set up this community uh, about 18 months ago now, and it is there for you to use. It's a global network for midwives and nurses everywhere, whatever level of nursing or midwifery people come from. So whether you're a student or whether you're a very senior midwifery leader, I do urge you to join it. Um, it's there to really strengthen our commitment to universal health coverage. Um, it works with partners all over the world. You'll see comments, uh, sessions, questions, debates, discussions, news, events um, that will really, I hope, support the work that you're doing in your countries. We set it up because member state countries asked us to do so. They said, this is what we want. We would like a network where nurses and midwives can talk to each other and learn the lessons that they have in their own countries and share them with other people. So this is your platform, your forum. Um, I do hope you will be able to use it as, as much as the 6,000 members that have already joined it. As part of that, we held a webinar, um, several webinars last year, and we talked about emergency care training. And it came out very clearly from the questions and the themes that were raised during those sessions that nurses and midwives felt that they hadn't had enough training and skills in emergency care. Past the pandemic, people had said that they had been redeployed from their uh, normal roles to go and work on looking after patients with COVID-19 who perhaps hadn't had the skills and training at the time to do so. So we've taken that on board. We've listened to what you've been um, saying to us and delighted to say that on World Health Day, the 7th of April um, this year, just last month, Dr. Tedros launched our emergency care uh, campaigns, emergency care to save lives. It's a 25 by 25 by 25. And our commitment in that is to say that we will support the training of nurses and midwives in emergency care in 25 countries. So we will support 25% of nurses and midwives in 25 countries by the end of 2025. So I'm just going to talk you through this campaign so that you can um, hopefully understand what we're trying to achieve. And, and, and this is a real ask to say, please, please join it. Please come on board and please, please um, strengthen nursing and midwifery response to emergency care through strengthening your own skills. So we know emergency care providers save lives. We've got a lot of data which shows that um, one in two people in many countries we think die um, annually from an emergency situation because the people that are there do not necessarily have the skills needed to care for them immediately. We know we can reduce disability from emergency situations by one, one in three. So we, we know that a lack of emergency training puts the lives of acutely ill and injured patients at risk. And when I'm talking about acutely ill, I'm talking about people who have hemorrhage, who have sepsis, uh, who have uh, cardiac arrest or stroke, um, as well as patients and, and people who have trauma and, and accidents and the effects of uh, climate change, the, the traumas from theirs, from um, humanitarian disasters and through conflict, generate communities that really need nurses and midwives everywhere with really strong strengthening skills in emergency care. 
So we play as a community, we play a key role in the man management of emergency medical situations. But we know that in many countries, we, don't have, we haven't had the opportunity to train and the emergency care that we need to provide needs good training. So what are we planning to, to teach? Um, eight years ago, the, w, the World Health Organization established a program called the Basic Emergency Care Course. It's a five day face to face program that delivers training uh, through skill stations, um, hands on practice um, into supporting care uh, for people when they have an emergency. In many countries, this is delivered already, but there is a very low uptake in this training from nurses and even lower uptake in this training from midwives. And the purpose of this campaign is really to address that balance and to strengthen the skills by training 25% of all nurses and midwives in countries where they need the training most. So just to introduce you to this campaign, 25 by 25 by 25, and you'll hear me say that many times, I expect over the next few months as we scale up this campaign and seek help from organizations who would really um, become, we hope will become partners in, in what we think will be really valuable to saving lives. We are absolutely determined that this is a member state led uh, program. We recognize that emergency care, emergency training is different. Emergency needs are different in different countries. So we want to work with countries to make sure that the program meets the needs of the individual countries and is run by the countries within which we train. Uh, we want to make sure there is a sustainable program which has educational accreditation and is really useful for nurses and midwives as part of their CPD. It's not an expensive course to train. We've calculated that to train one midwife costs approximately $120. So we're working with global partners to support the funding of this so that we can deliver it. Obviously, some of the numbers in countries are, are large. Um, so the budget to be able to support this needs to, needs to reflect that. So, as I said before, um, the doctor, uh, Director General launched this campaign in the beginning of April. And you can see from this slide here, we have um, a plan to scale up this course over the course of the next three years. So over the next few months, we're planning um, how we will roll this out, what the um, rollout team needs to include, what are the countries that would be the like to be part of this as early adopters of the training. And then phase two, we explore how we train our trainers. So, so our plans are to ensure that within our communities, nurses and midwives not only trained in the program, but a percentage of those people who are trained in the program will become the trainers of it. So there is a sustainable model that can continue to grow throughout the countries and, and increase the numbers of people who have, can have access to this training. Um, as I've said before, in phase three, we will ensure that the course is delivered in accordance with the national context. So making sure that it's relevant to the countries that want to take this program forward. Phase four, which will be a huge scale up, um, many courses uh, delivered all over the world. And this is where we rely on support from our partners to help us to do that. And that will take place in 2024 and 25. And then as we come to the end of the um, program, we want to make sure that we've built in a sustainable model. And through our community of practice, we will then be able to provide refresher training support and resources to make sure that if you've had your training maybe a year, two years before, there's an opportunities to update your skills through the work and the sessions and the, and the live learning that we host through our community of practice that I talked about just earlier on. So we hope to make a great impact on emergency care through this, through this program. Um, Depending on the countries that will adopt this, it's unclear yet who they all, who they all will be, um, but we estimate that we will be able to train 250,000 nurses. But that really depends on the countries that choose to adopt um, the campaign. Some, some countries have small numbers of nurses and midwives, as you know, and others have huge numbers of nurses and midwives. So we want to make sure that we can scale this up to meet all the needs of the countries that want to take this program first. So why now? I mentioned that just a little bit at the beginning, but it's really important that we use this as a tool 
to scale up our response to emergency care. We know that we have to learn lessons from the global pandemic, and we're listening to what nurses and midwives have been telling us over the last few months about how they need to strengthen their own skills. We know this is to be an accelerated program. Three years is a tight timeline to be able to treat, uh, to teach so many numbers, great numbers of, of, of nurses and midwives. But we really know that we have to accelerate this program in order to reach, reach the sustainable development goals. So we will be seeking funding from our public and from donors. Uh, we're creating some innovative ways of, of finding donor money, um, hoping that we'll be able to have um, campaigns to sponsor a midwife, sponsor a nurse, sponsor a program, sponsor a country, and, and hoping that this will attract um, support and funds from people worldwide who can really um, support the, the development and strengthening of emergency care, nursing and midwifery. There's information on our community of practice about all of this now. So do have a look if you, you'll find it very easily in the community. There's lots of resources that talk about the program, what the course involves. Uh, within it, we are going to be supporting a research program, um, an educational program to make sure this fits with competency based learning. Um, and additionally, we're going to be able to pro we're, we're, we're building a mentorship and supporting program around this too, so that the trainers of the program um, and the nurses and midwives who take the program and become trainers of it will seek will have um, mentorship support from people who have been delivering this um, and their experienced trainers already. So we're trying to make sure that the infrastructure around this course is is solid and strong, so that it isn't just a a case of, of doing a five day training and then we, we leave people to then continue by themselves. We intend to make sure that the systems around will strengthen the entire healthcare system to provide better support for emergency care for people who need it most. And I think you had the opportunity to um, hear from our wonderful chief nursing officer, Dr. Amelia earlier on, who is the real um, front face of this campaign um, and really does, and I'm speaking for her here, but does believe that the way we will do this is by doing this together. Um, this is a huge, a huge project. It's an ambitious, ambitious targets. Um, but I think I would, I, I, you will hear more about this. You will hear more from Dr. Amelia about this. Um, and we know that with your support, we can close these gaps to strengthen our emergency care services and ultimately make a massive impact on, on life saved. I just wanted to add this slide. It was launched on the uh, start of the World Health Organization's 75th anniversary. Um, you'll see this beautiful logo in many of our presentations and on our uh, slides over the next few months. Um, but I think what we're trying to do is really set the bar high um, for providing really great, uh, strong support to development and education of midwifery. Um, I thank you very much for listening to that. I really do hope that you'll join our community, that you'll become involved with this. And I really hope that you'll find some um, inspiration from being able to do a course and use the skills that you'll gain from it um, to help the people that you serve in your community. So I think there's so much to gain from all of this. And thank you very much indeed for letting me have the chance to talk to you about it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Emily and uh, Frida and uh, I are going to um, start with the, you're going to do the thanks and then we'll go to the Q&A. So thanks, Frida. Thank you, Jane. So actually, I want to, to actually hand over to you because now we are starting the, the session that I'm actually looking forward to the most. And that is the question and answer session. So I will actually to introduce the moderator for that session, and that is Jane Houston. And she will be supported by Liet and Becker. Uh, so you can actually turn on your camera, Jane, again. So I will hand up this session for you. And I know that you want all the presenters to have the camera on too. So over to you, Jane. Well, thank you so much, Frida, and to everybody. Um, we've just been getting some fantastic uh, chats. So as our, our amazing WHO team rolls in, I'd just like to say 
Billy Hunter wrote, thank you, Indian Florence. Uh, this is a positive experience of piloting the ECBC. It's so wonderful to hear. Come on in, don't be shy, come on into the room. <clears throat> um, Seal Jevitt wrote, this project has had huge accomplishments. Lorraine Mockford wrote, looking forward to hearing more from Indy at session eight. And uh, Susanna wrote um, that in session 17, uh, later on, we'll be describing a project of the College of Midwives of Lima, Peru on midwifery first response team. So please, please don't be shy. Uh, I know you're you're all um, with the pandemic. We've all got very comfortable in virtual rooms. So come on back uh, for the Q and A. And we've got a few um, questions. So please, if you've got questions, uh, Leontine and I will be monitoring the chat. But we've actually got a couple of couple of questions here. So um, I'd love to uh, go ahead and um, ask. Um, particularly uh, for the, um, this will be for um, Justine. If uh, yeah, yeah, you are. You you were really great there, saving the day. You just swerved right back in there without missing a beat. Um, we did hear um, a lot about um, the role of midwives in the amazing uh, stage work transitioning, but we were there was a question actually I received from Nepal about um, what part do you think um, OBGYNs play in this transitioning uh, and about being included in the process and what are our, our collaborative uh, physician OBGYNs thinking about this topic? So over to you, Justine, thank you. Thank you very much. That is uh, maybe a tricky question, Jane, to start <laughs> with the question. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. Well, if you remember um, the stage recommendation, it was about transitioning to a collaborative midwifery model of care and collaborative means that um, midwifery model of care is not just for midwives it's also about contributing with other cadres of course and in this work this was very important so in the members of the working group um, the international federation of gynecologists and obstetricians are part of um, the working group um, and so are other uh, professional associations and um, within the subgroups as well, we have uh, pediatrician, nurses, um, obstetricians. So I can't um, speak for them uh, on what they think about the work, but um, the obstetricians that are joining the working group and uh, subgroups are very eager to work in collaboration um, on this important work and uh, are very thrilled about um, working together. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually based in the USA, so I, uh, I appreciate your candor on that. And uh, there is actually, if anyone out there wants to ask a question in Spanish, uh, we do have uh, many members on our committee um, that are uh, Spanish speakers, so we'd love to have, we can, we can um, do that as well. So the next question up uh, is for the toolkit and the EC, ECPC. And it's from the Netherlands uh, for Ms. Indy Carr and Dr. Florence West. Um, so I, we were all very taken uh, with this toolkit and the ECBC. And do you have any um, comments or, or pro tips if there's a country or a specific hospital or university would like to implement uh, one of the courses? Um, how, how, would that, how would that look uh, if somebody wanted to contact you about that? Indeed, do you want to take this? Uh, yeah, um, it's been really um, interesting because we've the ECBC is there to contextualize it to country context. So, for example, the modules are there, um, and when you go to another country, you can actually change the names and make it more country context. And uh, we will be more than happy to share our experiences uh, with the universities or whoever that's keen to uh, um, adopt the toolkit. Um, I'm more than happy, I'll leave my email ID and I'm sure Florence would be too because she was heavily involved at that as well. Florence, anything else that I may have missed? No, that's perfect. Um, it really is a, a like a, a package that you can take up and, and go with. There's a, 
a really detailed facilitator guide for every course and a learner guide uh, as well. Um, and as Indy said, we're both very happy to uh, be contacted for more information. And uh, if Frida uh, re receives any uh, inquiries, she can pass them on to us as well. Wonderful. That's great. And we can also take questions en français if we need to also. So this is great having uh, all these wonderful international uh, midwives and healthcare providers right here in this room. And I'd just like to uh, announce, I mean, we had a fantastic attendance. We had over 19 countries in the room. So I think that's, that's pretty outstanding uh, for our pre-conference. So I've got a, a probably a, maybe a final question. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I have a question. Um, uh, Susanna is going to have a question, actually. Would you like to ask a question, Susanna? Yes, uh, actually, it's, it's hard to... I, I want to do it in Spanish. Yo creo que es un poco difícil hacer las preguntas en español porque la sesión ha sido en inglés. Entonces, no hay mucho que preguntar cuando la sesión es en inglés. There is no much to ask sometimes in Spanish because the session was in English. So, yeah, to, to make the questions in, in Spanish will be a bit difficult, but... Quiero uh, hacer un resumen de que hoy en la presentación se, se ha hecho esta introducción del trabajo en educación y el trabajo de respuesta en emergencia de la carrera de obstetricia y de cómo el trabajo de, de, de obstetricia, partería y matronería se ve desde un lente de colaboración más que de poder y desde un ente eh, de, de dominación de una carrera profesional. Desde mi posición como una obstetra que trabaja en América Latina eso, y en países de, en este caso Perú y, y con otros colegas chilenos, bolivianos, que yo sé que están aquí presentes, quisiera saber cuál es la forma en que la Organización Mundial de la Salud va a asegurarse de que las las voces de los latinoamericanos o los hispanohablantes pueden acceder a estas sesiones cuando la mayoría de las sesiones generalmente son en inglés. I was asking how the Health World Health Organization is going to make sure that Latin American countries or Spanish speaking countries are going to access all these amazing opportunities where usually the conferences, for example, today, uh, most of the information is given in English. So even Asking questions is difficult for, for our counterparts. Thank you. I would generally like to um, make a response to uh, Susanna, our amazing partera amiga. All right, Justine. Sí, yo podría contestar um, en, bueno, al, al menos para el trabajo de stage, cuando tuvimos que elegir a los miembros de los grupos de trabajo y de los subgrupos grupos de trabajo, Um, tuvimos, bueno, hemos reflexionado muchísimo sobre la representación de las regiones del mundo y de las subregiones del mundo. Y entonces, en, en los subgrupos de trabajo, si tenemos a personas de Latinoamérica, eh, es verdad que el, el problema del idioma es siempre un problema porque las reuniones, eh, más bien los correos electrónicos, todos se hacen mucho en, en, en inglés pero también eh, hacemos lo máximo para poder colaborar con personas de todo el mundo y eso es parte del mandato de la organización también. Así que al menos eh, tenemos a, a varias personas de su región y muy orgullosos de tenerlos con nosotros. Um, I was saying that um, in stage at least, we made sure that we were ensuring the representation from all regions and we have members from uh, Latin and American and the Caribbean as well, but uh, Hispano Hablantes, the person, uh, the person who are speaking Spanish. Yeah, thank you. Uh, wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're very much engaged at VIDM and in, including as many languages um, as we can uh, to make it um, equitable uh, and available. So uh, thank you so much. Is there any further questions for this uh, outstanding panel of experts. All right, well, I think it's time to say, oh, sorry, Emily, go ahead. Oh, I was I was just going to say that our community of practice um, can be accessed in Spanish. Um, in fact, there's several languages there and you just click on the choice of language that you have. And um, all our global webinars are translated into the six UN languages. So anything that is there 
um, from our Global Live Learning Center, uh, you'll find you'll be able to listen to it in Spanish. If you don't, even if you don't get to listen to it live on the day, the recordings with the interpretation is there included as well. Just thought I'd add to that to say we do we do really recognise the language issues are huge, and we must you know we try as much as we can to make sure that they're accessible to as many people as possible. Yeah, muy importante. That's so such a great point. So. Um, thank you so much. So if we just uh, like to uh, thank uh, this outstanding panel once again, and you can go ahead and put your applause uh, on uh, for all our wonderful uh, colleagues in, in healthcare and midwifery. Thank you so much. And uh, Chris Woodhouse has raised his hand. And he's put his hand down again. All right, I guess he's given us applause. All right, so if y'all want to go ahead and uh, probably get a well-earned sleep because I think some of you it's the middle of the night so I uh, thank you again uh, uh, from us at VIDM to all of you and please reach out and support um, International Day of the Midwife with the World Health Organization and do register it was super easy I registered um, for um, your uh, registration very simply using the QR code and I'm old so and I could do it so and uh, just get your get your um, registration in there so thank you thank you to everyone again so I'm going to um, say thank you, and I'm going to um, hand over uh, to Dr. Uh, um, <clears throat> Frida Berg again to introduce Dr. Anshu Banerjee, and we're going to keep on this slide uh, as we close out the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. So uh, now we are going to, this is the end of this webinar, and we want to end uh, to hear what Dr. Uh, Anshu Banju, Director of, of uh, the Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child, Adolescent Health and Agents at WHO, actually my, my boss, I say it like that. So over to you to give your closing remarks. Thank you very much, Frida, and what an amazing session that was uh, and all the evidence that was presented um, I think we started with a kind of problem statement, uh, first of all, that we have 800 women dying of maternal mortality every day, um, and how do we address that, and the critical role that midwives play within that. But also, of course, we have around 2.3 million newborns dying uh, every year, and um, essential newborn care is also provided by midwives. So um, I think the evidence really highlight, highlights the role that midwives play in providing services. So we looked at a couple of issues. First of all, planning. And we know that we have a gap of 900,000 midwives in order to be able to provide globally the kind of uh, RMNCH services that are required. And so how do we ensure that um, we fill these positions and how do we uh, move countries forward in, in providing that kind of support and thinking through how to do that? We looked at leadership and I think uh, we looked at the midwifery model of care and uh, how can midwives actually move that issue forward and how can we have midwifery-led continuity of care that improves services for mothers and newborns. So, for example, from Liberia, we heard on how to uh, improve leadership is taken forward by a national midwifery leadership task force. Uh, we looked at education and, uh, of course, we want that all midwives are trained uh, according to international standards, according to the ICM standards. And for that, WHO has been working on the Interprofessional Midwifery Education Toolkit and has also introduced an innovative kind of teaching methodology that has been highlighted as part of the Essential Childbirth Care uh, course. We also heard about the new initiative, the 25 times 25 times 25 campaign for basic emergency care and how WHO would like to take that forward and train up to 250,000 health professionals to um, strengthen their basic skills. And again, a lesson from Liberia was to establish a, an alliance at the country level to really strengthen education. Um, Looking at service delivery, all of this planning, scaling up uh, um, the number of midwives that are going to be recruited, uh, the leadership um, uh, led uh, the leadership for midwives, 
as well as education, of course, all is going to support the service delivery. And we heard that about 80% of services for this population group, mothers and newborns, um, is, it can be provided through, through, um, through midwives or by midwives. And again, therefore, it's so crucial that we take this forward. Um, I think what we also wanted to highlight was the importance of the experience of care. And that's why this continuity uh, um, of care model is very important. Um, in the WHO guidelines, both for antenatal care, interpartum care, and postnatal care as part of our quality of care uh, standards, we are really highlighting the importance of the experience of care, not only provision of care, the supply side, but also the demand side and the experience of care. And one issue that really stands out there is the issue of respectful care. And finally, I think we heard about how WHO wants to support this uh, through the stage working group, the issues that they're looking at. And really we as WHO are, are ready to support any country that would like to move towards a continuity uh, model of care uh, that wants to move from uh, let's say um, systems where there are no uh, professional midwives to systems where we have continuity-led care by um, by midwives. So uh, that is our commitment, and I want to thank everyone for joining today. And thank you very much. This is the story of health. No, it's not just about eating your vegetables and growing taller. It's about how the world's people came together to help us all live long and healthy lives. Making amazing discoveries like new medicines and vaccines. Guiding us to grow up healthy, strong and happy. Keeping us safe from nasty diseases, painful ones and deadly ones. And some horrible ones you've never heard of because they were completely wiped out. The end of smallpox, the magnificent chapter in international collaboration. This long-awaited malaria vaccine is a breakthrough for science. has finally been declared free of wild poliovirus. It was really a story of human perseverance, innovation, commitment, bringing communities together towards one unified goal. This is a story about all of us, because we all played a role. And if we can keep working together, We'll make more discoveries, have more victories over diseases, and help even more people be healthy and happy in the future. It just uh, really remains for me to say a happy, a, such a happy day uh, to be a midwife and to say, Happy International Day of the Midwife, especially to our wonderful World Health Organization team. Let's give them a big round of applause again.